Well, thank you all for, for being with us this afternoon. I'm Robin Waits. I'm the Executive Director with Historic Columbia. Um, and we are delighted to offer this presentation this morning that's part of our Columbia City of Women uh, initiative and also a monthly research roundtable for Historic Columbia. Um, this is a, a, an opportunity for y'all to hear from two of our rising scholars in Columbia, South Carolina, um, Catherine Allen and Melissa DeVelvis. Kat is the Director of Research at Historic Columbia. Um, she holds a dual MA, was completed in 2012 in Public History and Library Science from the University of South Carolina. Her ongoing projects include the Columbia City of Women effort, which you'll learn a little bit more about today and the forthcoming reinterpretation of the Majeska Monte Simpkins House. Melissa DeVelvis is a Bridge postdoctoral teaching fellow at the University of South Carolina. She holds a PhD in history with a focus on women and gender in the 19th century South from USC. She worked at Historic Columbia as one of our weekend staff for four years and her current projects include adapting her dissertation on women South Carolinians and secession into a book, as well as developing a digital history project that maps the movements of former, formerly enslaved Colombians. So we look forward to learning more about that as those projects progress, Melissa. I'm really um, delighted to, to offer you um, insight from these young women today and certainly are Thankful to the City of Columbia and Wren, our partners in the Columbia City of Women effort. I'm going to turn things over now to our presenters. Oh, sorry, one more housekeeping thing. Sorry. Um, we are gonna, we, we welcome y'all to ask questions along the way. Um, you can just type those into the chat and I will see them and share them with our presenters as we, as we wrap up. Um, this afternoon. So please feel free at any point if you have a question to type that into the into the box and I'll share. And thank you all again for being with us. All right, I suppose, Kat, do you want me to start or do you want to start? Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> all right, hello everyone. Uh, excited to talk to you today about suffrage, uh, especially since the past two weeks have been really celebrating the centennial, as you all probably obviously know. Um, and so my job here today is to uh, give you some of the background for not just the 19th Amendment, but the road to it, the ratification. And then Kat is gonna do a lot of the um, City of Women spotlighting uh, women in Colombia who were directly involved with this and in many cases um, due to race or the state that they lived in which did not ratify at the time uh, did not get the uh, recognition that um, in many cases they deserve. Uh, so crash course from Seneca Falls to separation here is the introduction to the suffrage movement in the United States. So from the beginning the women's rights movement was uh, pretty much hand in hand with abolition and other movements such as temperance. And so uh, it wasn't just a push for only suffrage for a very long time. It was a union of women's organizations and women working closely with other organizations, in this case, abolition. Uh, we do look at Seneca Falls, the convention in which we uh, come with a list for women's rights in uh, 1848 as the beginning of this movement. However, from the uh, 1830s onward, you see uh, women working very closely with the American Anti-Slavery Society, looking for the rights of not just enslaved African-Americans, but women as well. Um, one of the uh, examples are the Grimke sisters, and these are the women you see on the left. Um, well left. I, it's paired. Either way, you can see them on the PowerPoint. Um, uh, these two are women who were born in South Carolina, Charleston, to be specific, and they actually wrote anti-slavery texts to South Carolinian women. Uh, their works were later banned. They were actually banned from the state of South Carolina and became women's rights activists and uh, abolitionists in the North. Um, we also see some uh, early figures that are also very closely involved in anti-slavery, such as Lucretia Mott, uh, Lucy Stone, and of course, you see uh, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton over on um, in a little bit of their later years. And so all of these women are very much involved both in um, abolition and also women's suffrage. 
Uh, so much so that during the Civil War, um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton actually suspended their work for women's rights and founded the Women's National um, Loyal League, which petitioned for a constitutional amendment to end slavery and build support for the 13th Amendment. Uh, they are uh, Elizabeth and uh, Susan B. Anthony, Lucretia Mott, all of these women are close friends with um, Frederick Douglass, uh, other people working for uh, emancipation and the dignity of people who are not citizens and do not have suffrage. Um, and so after the Civil War is when you really start to see with the question of these new, uh, what we call the Reconstruction Amendments, um, who is going to get suffrage. So at the time, the women's movement and the women's rights movement is not looking for woman suffrage. They're asking for universal suffrage at this time. Uh, and so they're pushing for a universal suffrage amendment. Um, and in 1866 is when you see the founding of the American Equal Rights Association. Uh, again, regardless of gender or race, suffrage for all. Uh, this is not only Stanton and Anthony, but also uh, Lucy Stone, Lucretia Mott, uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, Abby Kelly Foster and Henry Blackwell, who is Lucy Stone's husband. So all of the big names, if you guys are uh, abolition scholars at all, are here as well. Um, however, the 14th Amendment throws in a wrench in which uh, citizens and voters are classified as male in the Constitution in this amendment in 1868. Uh, this really upsets uh, Southerners, as you can probably tell, who later claim that this is um, a coercive amendment because they had to ratify the amendment in order to rejoin the Union after the Civil War. Um, and also the connections between uh, what we see as kind of feminism and abolition will make uh, suffrage really hard in the South because it is tied to this uh, Northern abolitionist movement and uh, as we know in the South, sometimes we like to hold grudges. Um, and so this controversy over whether or not to then support the 15th Amendment, um, should we add a male vote or vote, uh, sorry, adding male to the Constitution for voting rights? Um, this actually causes a rift in the uh, American Equal Rights Association. We now see two different rival organizations, both the NWSA, so the National Women's Suffrage Association, so that's Stanton and Anthony. Um, they are wanting a constitutional amendment for women's right to vote. They split with the anti-slavery and abolitionist movements. Uh, they are very frustrated that now black men have the right to vote technically and um, white women do not. Um, Anthony will later even try to win over white Southerners by insisting that it was wrong for the government to enfranchise black men while allowing no women to vote. Um, on the other side, you see Lucy Stone, Henry Blackwell, uh, Julia Ward Howe, and others um, form the American Woman Suffrage Association, in which they continue to work with these um, anti-slavery groups um, and now trying to further black voting rights. And they're trying for individual state constitutions. So this is a thread you'll see throughout. Should we try for suffrage at the state or should we try for suffrage on a national level? And depending on the time period, it's different. Um, and the strategies are different. So after the 15th Amendment is passed, uh, you see the party split. Even Frederick Douglass is breaking with Stanton and Anthony over their position within what is now the NWSA. And But it's also in the 1870s where we see um, in 1878, the language for the uh, what they wanted to be the 16th Amendment, which will later be the 19th Amendment, which was sometimes called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, um, it's almost identical to what is eventually passed. And so our 19th Amendment is first um, proposed and introduced in its first form in 1878. So this is kind of the beginning of the women's suffrage uh, push. It comes from the women's rights movement. And uh, this is the first, but definitely not the last time that the issue of race will cause um, issues for the suffragists. Uh, next from there, Kat. And we'll go into South Carolina specifically. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. I'm gonna start out by talking about the Rollins sisters. So hopefully some of you were able to attend Dr. Val Littlefield's talk a couple weeks ago about them. Please know that we could spend an hour more e on each of these women, but we only have a few minutes today. So situating the Rollins sisters uh, within the context that Melissa just described. So there were five sisters, Frances, Charlotte, Catherine, Louisa, and Florence. Um, the eldest, Frances, was born in 1845. They were all born free women of color in Charleston and educated there and 
in the North as well. Um, kind of just a brief overview, they were actually not just suffrage, suffragists, but early equal rights activists dating back to almost immediately after the Civil War during Reconstruction, civil employees in state government in South Carolina, and then the co-founders of the South Carolina's first chapter of the American Woman Suffrage Association, which Melissa just described. And this is one of two photographs that exist of Miss Frances Ann Rollin before she is married and because, becomes Frances Rollin Whipper. Um, this would have been life in her likely early 20s. Um, but let's scroll back a little bit. So I said equal, equal rights activist. The Rollins sisters first appear in 1867 in an article that's published in the Daily Phoenix. Um, you'll note that the Daily Phoenix is actually a democratic newspaper. And so this, this particular article had a very political point that it was trying to make about the quote differences in the North, which was very much run by the party of Lincoln, uh, the Republicans and uh, the South, which at that time was under, um, was under federal rule. And it's for pointing out the difference, uh, part of history of these unjust, unequal, hypocritical uh, times. But what's interesting is the second half of this article, which is talking about how equal rights is being forced, enforced in South Carolina. Uh, we say, we merely wish to remark that if the incident had occurred in South Carolina, this railroad agent would have been compelled to pay a fine of at least $250, for that was the amount that Ms. Frances Rollin, a quote, respectable female of color one against the captain of the steamer pilot boy. So this takes place in 1867. Frances Rollin, who's still unmarried, is denied pa first class passage on this steamer because she was a woman of color. And she filed a claim with the Freedmen's Bureau and she won. She won $250. It's one of the earliest acts uh, promoting equal rights, not just for women, but specifically for people of color in this reconstruction period. You know, during the course of this incident, she meets uh, Major Martin Delaney, who was formerly with the Freedmen's Bureau, and she agrees to write his biography. And to do this, she actually moves to Boston. He is supposed to help uh, fund, you know, pay her to help write this biography, but she never really receives any payment. So she's actually living in Boston, uh, meeting with people uh, like future professor at USC, Richard T. Greener, um, attending different parties, learning about politics, and all the while, she's making her own money by taking and watching um, from other people in the community in Boston. But I wanted to include this quote because this is from her diary um, from 1868. It was republished in a book called We Are Your Sisters, edited by Dorothy, Dorothy Sterling. Um, and she's noting, Washington's birthday, I am no enthusiast, enthusiast over patriotic celebrations as I am counted out of the body politic. And of course, we know that she's not just referring to her skin color, she's also referring to the fact that as a woman, she has no political rights. So she's already, before she's coming back to South Carolina and getting involved in reconstruction in a later period, she's already very much invested and involved in gaining the right to vote. Uh, just a few months later, as Melissa said, the 14th Amendment passes and black men are granted the right to vote in South Carolina. And what that means is that in 1868, for the first and still only time in history, the South Carolina legislature is a black, has a black majority. And of course they had the 1868 constitution in which they pass, uh, they create free schooling for all uh, students of South Carolina. Um, so they move back, she moves back to South Carolina. Her sisters join her in what they call the Rollins Salon in Columbia, South Carolina. Um, they become more and more active 1869, 1870. And this culminates in the founding of the very first chapter of South Carolina's chapter of the American Women's Suffrage Association. And this is the quote that you've probably seen repeated in all of these presentations about the Rollins sisters, but this is the second oldest sister, or perhaps third. We've been going back and forth with census records and trying to figure out who's older um, because it changes. Uh, and this is Charlotte, who's known as Lottie Rollin. Um, and this is actually published in the Women's Journal, which was founded by Lucy Stone, one of the women uh, the suffragist leaders that uh, Melissa mentioned. And here she says, we ask suffrage not as a right, not as a privilege, but as a right based on the ground that we are human beings and as much entitled to all human rights. So this is huge, right? So this is kind of one of the earliest uh, moments in South Carolina, especially that um, women are calling out that they deserve equal rights. Uh, and this takes place in February of 1871. Um, throughout the next year, they continue to push for legislation. Uh, there is a bill that's introduced in the House of Representatives, but ultimately gets nowhere. 
Um, and there are reports that there was a fist fight that broke out uh, during the debate over that legislation. And that ultimately kind of kills any momentum women might have in South Carolina. Um, but they continue to meet. Uh, this is a, a newspaper article from November 12, 1872. And I include this one specifically because we know for a fact this took place in what we know as the Rollins Salon. This image you, you'll see here is from 1872. It's a bird's eye view of Columbia in that year. And the arrow you see is pointing to the Rollins Salon. Um, and then the far upper left corner is actually the state house grounds and just north of it is Trinity uh, Episcopal Church. So that kind of gives you and an just shows you how central they were right in the midst of things in downtown Columbia in 1870s. And what's really interesting about these people that are meeting is that it's a mixture of men and women. It's a mixture of men who are political leaders in the Republican Party, the governor elect uh, Franklin Moses. We have Alonzo Ranzier. Uh, William J. Whipper, who again is by this point married to Frances Rollin. We see Miss Lottie Rollin, but you also see Miss Martha Schofield. And of course she goes on to found uh, a school in Aiken and is one of the big inspirations of Dr. Matilda Evans's life. Um, so you're kind of seeing this intergenerational, intergenerational uh, sharing of ideas uh, and kind of passing down to future generations happening in 1872. The Rollins sisters, this house was actually owned by Catherine Rollin, uh, hold on to this until 1875 and eventually lose it in a tax sale. And of course, the following year, uh, Wade Hampton is elected governor in a uh, contested and likely illegal election um, in which he was helped by the red shirts uh, in 1876. And that spells the end of reconstruction in South Carolina and all of the sisters eventually move away. And that takes us through the 1870s locally. And I'll turn it back over to Melissa. Right, so this is when we enter the uh, the doldrums of the woman suffrage movement. And I say doldrums with uh, quotation marks because it doesn't end um, or it doesn't just go away. Uh, if anything, these women are working extra hard because they know the odds are so stacked against them. Um, and so after the party splits um, in 69, um, and there seems to be no more amendments after the 15th Amendment, and then um, helped, or I guess I should say hindered, by the end of Reconstruction. Uh, this is when you do see um, a slowing of the movement for suffrage throughout U.S. history. Um, however, as I mentioned, um, suffragists are still all over and trying very, very hard to pass on a state level, um, even a local level, uh, some women are allowed to vote in primaries in some states or sometimes just in some cities. Uh, it's all depending on uh, the level of legislature that we're looking at here. Um, and so in many cases uh, during the doldrums, so between 1870 and the 1890s, when you see the resurgence of the 1890s, um, we have to look out west. Uh, we don't really look in the south. Um, there are not many uh, organized suffrage movements in the region until the 1890s in the U.S. South. Um, however, we have women uh, suffragists traveling throughout the United States. Uh, this is when we start to get the heyday of the state fair in which all the speakers will come. And so you see a lot of uh, pretty much stump speakers that are suffragists moving throughout the um, 70s and 80s, 80s and traveling like this. Um, and so there are many of them are moving west. Can, in, yeah including Susan B. Anthony, who um, in 1871 went to Oregon Territory and traveled uh, 2,000 miles across Oregon and Washington trying to push the Oregon legislature to ratify suffrage. Um, however, they were never successful. The only success for Oregon was uh, 1877, a school suffrage law, which is in many cases kind of school suffrage is the concession um, for the angry suffragists who, you know, want the vote. Um, now, the West is very lucrative because, again, these are territories. And so, for instance, Wyoming in 1869, um, the territory gave women suffrage. But that doesn't mean that when these territories are accepted as states, they will receive suffrage. And actually, in many cases, such as Utah and Montana, the territories receive suffrage and then are often negated on um, little legalities or technicalities. Um, and in many cases, by the time they become states, do not have suffrage anymore. So when we say in the doldrums, we really mean that um, the battles are being lost. Um, it's not that there are no battles happening. And so this um, very distracting timeline, I apologize, uh, kind of goes through, well, what is happening 
in this time period. And you can see here that even though uh, a lot of movements are happening in the West, you don't see them added as states until the tens. Um, and then when we get very, very close to the actual ratification process. But so these are the states before we get to the big ratification movement that have already had state suffrage intact. So these are the places where state suffrage has worked. Um, and why the West? Okay, so for one, um, there's not a lot of organized opposition in the West to the suffragist movement yet. Um, another reason is because that's where a lot of the energy is focused. Um, in the case of Utah, um, Mormon women, while not necessarily um, radical women activists, um, have already been voting in um, church uh, assemblies for this time period. And the US Congress is actually trying to um, limit polyamory. And so these women actually come out to say, no, our vote really counts. And um, in many ways, this is opposition to US suffrage or the US Congress. So that's why we get suffrage in the Utah Territory. Um, however, there are some limitations within um, California, the fight in California, they bring it to the state so many times and every time it fails. Um, and one of those reasons is because of um, anti-Chinese rhetoric. And so we see in the same way that we see anti-Black rhetoric in the South, there is um, of nativist fear of, um, hey, maybe we should vote, uh, give women the vote so that Chinese men's uh, vote will be canceled out. And so in many cases, you see suffragists kind of uniting themselves with a cause that they might not necessarily like because they want to get suffrage promoted. So you do see that in the West a bit. Another reason why you don't see uh, a ton of suffrage when you look at kind of the US history book in this time period, um, it does not mean that women are not doing anything. Um, there are, this is where we start to see the rise of the club woman movement in the and the progressive movement. So in the 1880s and then especially by the 1890s, what you see are club women. And so they are forming groups to um, take care of neighborhoods, um, to uh, the uh, kind of sanitation pushes, uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The uh, temperance is a huge movement um, that women get involved in. And so these women, there are huge movements of groups of women being political. It's just suffrage is a kind of smaller portion of this. And within every group, for instance, when Frances Willard in the 1890s becomes head of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, um, really devotes itself to suffrage as well. So there's a there's an intersectionality to women's politics in this time period. It's just that suffrage is not prominent. And it's actually one of the reasons why suffrage is defeated in the West so many times is because of the anti, um, because of the liquor lobby, because they're so uh, opposed to temperance unions and temperance was usually pro suffrage, if that makes sense. Um, so all of this to say, we formed these networks of women um, and club women and enacting reform throughout communities. And we have primed ourselves for a resurgence in the 1890s. So what we see here is, whoop, knocking things over on my desk and I apologize. Um, in, the, uh, in South Carolina, which I'll speak on in a moment, um, you mostly see um, an exclusion of African-American women, unfortunately. Uh, this is at a time period in the 1890s is the nadir of race relations in the United States South. Um, in which most white suffragists in the South are indignant that black men had the vote and they did not. Um, so they either, either opposed black suffrage or did not wish to sabotage their own efforts to get suffrage um, by supporting black suffrage. And so you see a lot of exclusivity in the 1890 resurgence in the South. Um, and of course, the first new gains in the 1890s do come from the West. Uh, we see Wyoming entering the Union as a state in 1890 with woman suffrage intact. So from their territorial vote, they're able to bring that onto their state level as well. Um, and we see um, Colorado's state referendum campaign is successful in 1893. Um, and they, uh, Colorado is intersectional. It uh, involves Black women in its movements as well. And so Black women in Colorado have a voice within the same unit as white women. Uh, they also have common cause with the Knights of Labor and the Populist Party. So they are um, really using all of these reform movements to form these coalitions that have suffrage um, in mind. 
Uh, you also see Carrie Chapman Cat and uh, national organizations really working on the ground in Colorado. So it becomes really this national movement, even though they're working on a state by state basis in the 1890s. A huge turning point in particular in the 1890s is specifically in 1890 when um, the racial split is finally uh, merged together in the formation of NASA. So that's the National American Woman Suffrage Association. Uh, we've combined the two parties that had split to work together for suffrage. Um, Stanton, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is the honorary first president. She doesn't really do much. Um, it's pretty much Susan B. Anthony running it until Carrie Chapman Catt uh, begins her first term as president in 1900, and she is quite instrumental in pushing suffrage and will be mentioned throughout this PowerPoint. Um, we see um, within Black women suffragists, there are many, uh, some of the most famous Southern born Black women suffragists actually have to do a lot of their work in the North. They are run out of town quite literally. It is incredibly dangerous to be a political activist as a Black person in the South, let alone pushing for suffrage. And so Mary Church Terrell and Ida B. Wells Barnett, both of which were born in the South, um, do most of their work in the North. Um, Wells Barnett in Chicago and Mary Church Terrell in um, DC. Um, Ida B. Wells Barnett is also working with um, lynching organizations, uh, anti-lynching organizations, goodness, and Church Terrell in 1896 establishes the National Association of Colored Women and um, Colored Women Clubs as well. And with the foundation of the NAACP in 1909, most Black women, because they're excluded from a lot of white-only suffrage groups, are working for suffrage through black organizations and so focusing on racial uplift. And so we see um, a lot of suffrage speeches by black women in newspapers such as The Crisis, which is the NAACP's um, newspaper. And so that is where we see a lot of the black women activism, unfortunately not in our very own South Carolina. However, uh, we do see some women in South Carolina, which are, um, exclusively rich white women so that they can handle the storm that they're about to get from uh, Southern women. Uh, go back one more time. Sorry, Kat. I want to just show a picture of Abby Christensen. Um, yes. Uh, so this is the family of Abby Christensen, uh, Abby Holmes Christensen. And so in the 1890s, she is um, essentially, uh, she gets her son, Niels, who I believe Niels is the one on the back left, that son, uh, when he is in South Carolina Senate, he pushes through a suffrage bill, or he introduces one, does not manage to push it through, every session throughout his 40-year term with zero success in South Carolina. And so this is kind of what we're seeing in the South. Um, Abby Christensen is uh, the founding member of the South Carolina Equal Rights Association in 1891. Um, she is uh, quite... Um, unique in her whiteness and that she uh, is actually joining the South Car or the Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching Association is actually a lot more intersectional with uh, Black women than some um, Southern suffragists. This is also where we see what is called the Southern Strategy in the 1890s, in which uh, suffragists such as Laura Clay of Kentucky uh, remind the Northerners that, hey, if you want the South and you want a federal amendment, you need a two-thirds majority. And so they do start to utilize the language of, well, if white women can vote, they can cancel out the Black vote. Um, and uh, they therefore start to appeal to men that they might not have normally courted with the vote, and again, use um, often racist language and circulating this literature to uh, push for white woman suffrage in the South. Um, this comes to an end, this Southern strategy, when um, Mississippi tries to add a white woman only amendment. And uh, this is when Anna Howard Shaw, who was then the president of NASA said, no, that is against who we are. And you can see her on the left or might be the right for you all, she's labeled. Uh, and so that is kind of showing the limits of how far NASA is willing to go. Also, as a national organization, they cannot um, push through this um, white woman suffrage only narrative because the West has so many multiracial coalitions going for them. Um, and so this is where you see the 1890s kind of uh, a resurgence nationwide, but kind of petering out in the South. Uh, one of the reasons why is that um, the men of the South decide that instead of 
making women masculine by allowing them to vote, which is what they said would happen. Um, and it would make them less pure by participating in the ballot booth. They instead came up with um, literacy clauses, grandfather clauses, other ways to limit black suffrage, which I'm sure many of us at Historic Columbia are aware of. Uh, these methods are used instead. And so by the 1910s, the issue of, well, what if black men can vote is a null and void issue, unfortunately, in the US South. So we see a new, even larger resurgence, go back one cat, sorry. <laughs> uh, even larger in the uh, 1910s when people like Lucy Burns and Alice Paul, who have just come from England, are starting to pressure NASA to push for um, national suffrage again. Let's, it, let's not do state by state anymore. Let's, let's push it further. And so they are kind of the radical wing that pushes the more conservative NASA wing led by Carrie Chapman Catt. And so these women um, start to push for suffrage on a national level um, and they do not engage, well, Burns and Paul do not engage in the South whatsoever. And as you can imagine, the South Carolina suffragists are very much pro um, kind of the NASA uh, conservative group of ladylike petitioning, um, whereas Lucy Burns and Alice Paul will eventually form the National Women's Party in uh, 1916, which is the much more radical wing, which I'll talk about in a moment. So as you can imagine, the white women suffragists in the South are not members of the National Women's Party. Okay, now Kat, I'm sorry. So I wanna talk very quickly about um, in South Carolina, we see uh, the beginning of this new wave of suffrage in 1910. Uh, and one of those women is Eulalie Sally, who becomes interested in 1910 uh, with the custody battle of Lucy Dugas Tillman, who in 1909 has her children deeded away from her while she is convalescing from an illness that many people think was probably a miscarriage. She was married to Pitchfork Ben Tillman, so the Senator's son. The senator's son was both abusive and an alcoholic. He lived in Edgefield with his wife and um, often paraded through the streets uh, yelling things on drunken rages. Um, and so they briefly reconciled in 1909, so much so that she was actually in DC with the Tillmans um, as uh, Senator Tillman was in Congress when she was coalescing. Uh, and then Ben Tillman Jr. So her husband said that he was not fit to have his children, but also neither was his wife. And so he deeded his children to his parents. And so the ability for a man to deed children away really revealed the lack of rights that South Carolina women had. And so even these um, conservative lady like South Carolina women um, stuck to the tenets of motherhood. And so we're very, very outraged when they found out about this legal custody battle. Um, it's especially wild considering that Lucy Dugas Tillman, who eventually will drop Tillman and just be Lucy Dugas, um, was the granddaughter of um, our reconstruction, or reconstruction, our secession governor, Francis Pickens. And so this is kind of South Carolina royalty. And so this makes a huge scandal. This newspaper article was actually printed in um, California. And it makes Senator Bell, Ben Tillman, who really buckled down and said terrible things about his daughter-in-law and tried to keep his grandchildren away from her, um, it was not a good look and he got in a lot of trouble for it. Um, Eulalie, living nearby in Aiken, is disgusted by this. It inspires her to join the um, South Carolina Equal Suffrage League. Um, and she found an ad in the Columbia paper and she says, it's the best dollar I ever spent. And she rapidly becomes incredibly um, influential in this. Um, she eventually rises to become the president of the South Carolina branch of this in 1919 and talks to Carrie Chapman Catt uh, very frequently, uh, especially since it's 1919. Um, she is incredibly wealthy. She's incredibly independent. Her husband is the mayor of Aiken, uh, but even he is scandalized by what she does. She travels on unpaved country roads. She canvasses door to door. She flies in an airplane and scatters pamphlets. She took boxing lessons, and she led the first suffrage parade in South Carolina, which was the Aiken Suffrage Parade, as you can see um, there on horseback. Um, these parades are part of the um, 
winning plan of Carrie Chapman Cat, in which she ramps up and moves all suffrage movements to um, the National Constitutional Amendment. So no more kind of looking at a state by state level. She takes the giant org and says, we're looking at national suffrage now. So not only is Kat doing this, lobbying legislators and um, organizing networks such as Yulee Sally's network in South Carolina, but this is when Alice Paul and Lucy Burns leave in 1916 and um, they create the Silent Sentinels in which they picket. They are the first people to picket outside of the White House. They are the ones who are doing hunger strikes, who are having um, parades and being thrown in jail. Um, Alice Paul is put in solitary confinement to break her. Now these are unladylike methods. And so that's why you see the split in between these two organizations. But I argue that it's both of them working on their own um, level, and of course there are women that are kind of in between these two that actually help to get suffrage pushed. The other um, large factor in this, of course, is uh, the outbreak of World War I, in which um, while men are fighting overseas, the contributions of women uh, and the fact that they cannot vote is uh, very much a, um, a hypocritical uh, situation, and they finally push Woodrow Wilson to push for an amendment. He was uh, very notably uh, wanting it to be up to the states and said it's a state's rights issue. Of course, that, that means that the lower South is never going to get it. Uh, and so that is where we see it is finally brought up in the House of Representatives. In the House, it first passes in 1918. However, um, it does not make it through the Senate. Um, however, this ends, um, this session ends, and then once new legislators come in, it is uh, 1919, and it does pass from the House to the Senate, and then the race to ratify begins. Um, and so with both the winning plan and the picketing, uh, we see the scrambling movement to get the states to join, uh, one of which is Oklahoma. And so we actually have these telegrams of the South Carolina Library. I'm sorry about my thumb, which is very prominent in that picture. Um, and so these are telegrams between Yulee Sally, who was then the president of the South Carolina Suffrage League, um, and NASA President Carrie Chapman Catt, sending frantic telegrams saying, um, send telegrams to Oklahoma, even though she's in South Carolina. Um, she's also pestering the heck out of Woodrow Wilson, who at the time had had a stroke. And so these are just um, telegrams written to Wilson's secretary um, urging. So this one uh, says, have the president wire South Carolina legislature immediately urging ratification of suffrage amendment, make appeal strong, anti waging strenuous campaign. Anti-suffragists were incredibly influential in South Carolina. They tied Susan B. Anthony to Frederick Douglass. They tied Cherry, Carrie Chapman Catt to um, being pro-Black, essentially. And so the anti-suffragists very much tied it to race. And so uh, the letter before, there's also a very funny thing that says, no, we already told you President Wilson cannot talk right now. But that didn't stop you, Lily Sally. She is still pestering the president um, <laughs> um, for ratification. Uh, however, it is not successful, and in January uh, 28th of 1920, the South Carolina legislature votes against ratification, and with the exception of Texas, Arkansas, and then finally Tennessee, down to one vote because one of the voters' mother told him, yay for suffrage, essentially, um, please consider voting, yes, and he does, um, we finally see the two-thirds ratification necessary. Remember, we don't have Hawaii and we don't have Alaska yet. So uh, because you only need three-fourths majority to ratify, um, South Carolina um, does not need to, nor do any states in the lower South. And so the solid South did not vote to ratify. And for that reason, um, many South Carolina women almost immediately are um, not able to vote, even though the 19th Amendment says that we cannot um, discriminate on voting on the basis of sex. And we'll talk about what that means uh, in a moment. Hey everyone, it's Kat again. Um, just really quickly following along with you lately, Sally is, must be a relative of hers, uh, born Ida Sally in 1884 in, yes, Sally, South Carolina. Uh, she attended Winthrop University and after graduation married Cornelius Reamer. Uh, and moved to Columbia, where she lived across the street from the University of South Carolina. She was an early member of the Columbia Civic League, which is one of those leagues that Melissa mentioned uh, that was a group of women who were interested in civic improvements. This league in particular was responsible for a 1905 plan 
done by uh, the design the, the design firm Kelsey and Guild, and it was the first kind of uh, landscape plan for the city of Columbia. And she was also a founder of that Equal Suffrage League, uh, the Columbia branch, uh, that Eulalie Sally was kind of presiding over the statewide. And they joined after attending a meeting um, of the Virginia head uh, when she came down in 1914 uh, to speak at the Jefferson Hotel. So of course, this would have been all white women and a very few men, about 80 of them voted to form the Equal Suffrage League of Columbia. She was later the first president of the League of Women Voters and graduated first in her class at U of SC School of Law in 1922. Um, we, you know, Melissa talked about the Equal Suffrage League of South Carolina and especially looking at that fight over uh, Tillman's grandchildren. I think it's important, this is at Caroliniana and this is kind of, uh, their platform, basically. And you'll note that it says, uh, resolved that the Equal Suffrage League strongly desires to introduce a measure providing for the equal guardianship of children by women, by mother and father. So you're seeing some of this language that's happening in this 1909-1910 battle over Tillman's grandchildren reflected in this platform that's published in 1914. Um, other things that they were pushing for was a living wage for all, raising the age of consent from 14 to 21, and the abolition of child labor. So this is a very, very progressive platform that these women are putting forth in 1914. Um, we have this excellent photo from her granddaughter, Neela Edgar. Um, Ida Sally Reamer is in black, uh, immediately above where it says photo by Sargent, and her two children are the, the two children in white that are standing on that stop. So this was taken about 1918. The ratification race hasn't begun yet, um, but she's been involved with the movement for already four years and attending many of those parades like uh, Eulalie Sally. Uh, and Melissa already explained the whole ratification process. So we have, we have Tennessee, and then they have a big celebration in downtown Columbia. And then just a few days later, you have the first women in Columbia registering to vote. So you'll see here four Columbia women, misspelling here, so register, register Monday first in the state. You'll notice uh, number three, Ida Sally Reamer, homekeeper, residence 1507 Pendleton Street. Of course, she was not just a homemaker, right? She was civically involved in all types of organizations. She was getting ready, or she had actually already entered U of SC School of Law. And while she was at U of SC School of Law, she created uh, basically a, a citizenship course for women to prepare them for what they thought was coming, you know, the right to vote. Because during this time, fall of 1919, the, the race for ratification is already on. You'll see that there were two other women registered to vote, Bertha Turner Munsell, uh, who was kind of the, one of the other major leaders in Columbia, and then Edna Reed Whaley in Aiken, and then Isabel L. Kane, um, also of Columbia. And you'll note that they have to swear they've never been convicted of husband beating. Uh, and so they kind of laughingly swore this and that they had never committed any of the other crimes mentioned in the oath. I personally have never seen this full oath. I would love if anyone on this call has seen it at USC or anywhere else in any of these archives. I'd love to actually read it. Um, but of course, 1920, women are celebrating the right to vote. They're registering to vote. They're getting ready to participate. It's not open to everyone. And this uh, is from the Library of Congress, the NAACP papers. This is specific, specifically related to the Columbia branch of the NAACP, which was founded in 1917. This is a report, September 1920. Uh, our local papers mentioned that a small percentage of colored women registered when there were more than 100, it is said, that waited from morning until night, some standing in line six to eight hours. Many were turned down after being required to explain. The law specifically states that in order to qualify, the applicant must be able to read any part and write, hold on, I can't really see what this says, and write any part of the Constitution of the state of South Carolina. And of course, this is from the 1895 constitution that passes uh, as Tillman transitions from becoming governor to U.S. Senator that specifically uh, stripped black men of the franchise and that stripped black women of the franchise when they be, are able to vote beginning in 1920, right? So this is the next battleground beginning in 1920. So women like Ida Sally Reamer are able to vote. They're able to participate as poll registrars and as poll workers. Um, but this is not always the case for, um, for black women. Um, Ida Sally Reamer is also the first uh, president of the League of Women, the League of Women Voters of Columbia and Richland County. And you'll note here that these are the uh, kind of rules of that board. And you'll note the second paragraph that says, first, any white woman interested in making her vote count for the public good. So again, following along and aligning themselves with the Democratic Party, which was an all white party, was uh, politi politically expedient for them 
and in some ways necessary to have any of this legislation passed, but they also did so at the expense of including African-American women uh, who were not admitted to the League of Women Voters until we believe about 1968. Um, just really quick, do you wanna talk 1920s and then I gotta do two more women. Oh yeah, no, I'll do the super fast. Um, so 1920, uh, the vote is achieved, where do we go from here? So uh, Carrie Chapman Catt and others formed the League of Women Voters, as you mentioned, um, and it is uh, notable a nonpartisan organization. Uh, you also see Alice Paul moving forward with um, pushing for the uh, ERA. Uh, this is the Equal Rights Amendment. She introduces it immediately, and this is actually um, almost even laughed at um, because for the longest time, women pushed for suffrage based on their womanly qualities and not necessarily that we deserve to be equal to men in all ways. And so she's really radical in that. And so that's why you see the ERA introduced as early as 1920, continuing to um, face opposition until we see the second wave um, feminist movement. Um, just really quickly, um, Kat pointed this out a little bit. So you cannot limit someone's vote based on the, on the basis of sex, but you can sure have these property value restrictions or literacy clauses and things like this. And so um, looking down at uh, colored women voters, uh, many black women were still unable to vote. And then also there's the question of um, indigenous women suffragists who also pushed for suffrage. Not all indigenous women wanted suffrage because that would mean that they might lose their territorial status, um, but some wanted a form of dual citizenship in which they could vote for both. And so this is just a picture of Zitkala Sa who pushed very heavily for suffrage and also um, Native American rights. And uh, that was all. <laughs> So of course we we cannot do a do a talk with about women's suffrage without talking about uh, the matriarch of the South Carolina civil and human rights movement, Majeska Monteith Simpkins, born in 1899 here in Columbia, South Carolina, graduated from Benedict College, first worked as a teacher at Booker T. Washington High School until she married. Married teachers were not allowed to work specifically in Columbia Public Schools. Uh, she entered into the public health field as the first first director of Negro work, uh, the only uh, African-American uh, paid worker for the South Carolina Tuberculosis Association. And so she's seeing inequality all over South Carolina in uh, health care and ha access to health care. Uh, so she goes on to co-found the South Carolina State Conference of Branches of the NAACP in 1939. And then she is elected state secretary, uh, a position she holds from 1941 until 1957. And during that period, she is a key strategist in lawsuits uh, all kinds of civil rights issues, beginning with equal pay for teachers in 1944, and then moving on a few years later to voting rights, and then, of course, the integration of, of schools with Briggs v. Elliott, which is part of Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, but specifically, you know, USC South Carolina Political Collections has Majeska Monty Simpkins' papers, and here, and they have two voter registration cards for her. Uh, and this is the one that we always see on exhibition. This is uh, from when she was 28 years old, uh, so she obviously was able to pass the, the literacy uh, test of being able to read, write, understand the Constitution. Uh, the Monteith family was hugely involved with civil rights throughout their entire life. Uh, she grew up reading uh, with her mother and siblings, uh, extremely educated. So she was able to register to vote. But what you see on the right is the vote that actually takes place that year, right? This is the August 1928. But you'll note that it just says today's primary. It doesn't talk about a Democratic primary and a Republican primary. What's implicit here is that this is the Democratic primary, and you'll see a list of all the candidates. This is who everyone's voting for. Congressman, you see Sheriff of Columbia, or I guess Sheriff of Richland, Richland County, Coroner, House of Representatives, locally, Columbia Magistrate. These are all the positions uh, that are up for vote. Black men and women could not participate in this vote because they were not allowed to participate in the Democratic club primary system, which was sanctioned by the state of South Carolina. Uh, if there had been a Republican primary, which there wasn't more often than not, Simpkins could have participated. Uh, but basically, this is an example of just how stripped of the right to decide who was representing them, despite paying taxes and you know, participating fully as citizens, that she was not able, and she and other African Americans were not able um, to vote in elections like this. And uh, this, of course, leads to the lawsuit Elmer B. Rice, and I chose to show this kind of quickly as a highlight by using uh, the white-owned state newspaper in the Columbia Record. These are, high, these are headlines that appear beginning in 44 with the landmark ruling that Thurgood Marshall helped argue Smith v. Allwright in Texas, um, which basically says that you cannot have this uh, closed democratic primary system 
uh, to elect state representation. And so you'll see here Dixie reaction varies on high court, um, but it says that, you know, black citizens can take part in the Democratic primaries. Immediately, literally within a couple of weeks, the South Carolina legislature has a one week emergency session and they pass 147 laws, making sure that the Democratic primary in South Carolina is completely separated from the uh, like a state sponsored system. Right. So they try to create it, create it as a, a, a Democratic club. Right. And it's a private club. So not everyone can participate. And this leads to Elmore v. Rice. Of course, this is George Elmore at his store in Waverly. He is the one whose name goes on the ruling. He attempted to register and was successful, likely because they thought he was white. He was, he was quite light-skinned. Um, and then they, of course, strip him immediately from, from the register when they realize he wasn't. So he files a petition in 47, and he is ruled eligible. And this is in 1947. Of course, South Carolina keeps fighting it. Meanwhile, Simpkins is very, very involved with this, and I wanted to include this quote really quick. Thurgood Marshall always stayed in my home, as did the others as far as my home could accommodate. We had two extra bedrooms, and this is the home at 2025 Marion Street. We had some lawyers stayed there and the others stayed across the street from me, but they, they would have their meals and jam sessions around the table in my home. And what you'll see here is from the Library of Congress, and this is a letter to Mrs. Simpkins, and it says, before leaving the city last night, Mr. Marshall, this is Thurgood Marshall, Ask that I write and let you know that he received your note about the argument in the Baskin case and used part of it. He said that I was to thank you for the suggestion. Baskin is, of course, Brown v. Baskin, the, the, uh, the ruling that, follow, that comes a year after Elmore v. Rice, because uh, the Democratic Party in South Carolina is continuing to fight opening up the what was then all-white Democratic primary. You'll see here in February, uh, 435 white people are allowed to enroll and four African Americans are turned down. The Democrats make the plea to try to keep it closed. You'll see here on the left, this is evidence of just how dominant the Democratic Party is and how this truly was a one party system. You'll see the Democratic numbers of, of votes tallied, and then you'll also see the Republican, which in some years, for example, in, in both congressional and senatorial, there are no Republican votes cast, right? You'll see ultimately, though, that they win enrollment and are participating in primary. Uh, and then a few days later, on August 10th, vote is heavy, order prevails. And in that state headline, they noted that the weather was favorable. Um, here's that day. This is August 10th, 1948, downtown Columbia. This is on Taylor Street at the Pure Oil Service Station. This was Ward 9 voting district. This is where thousands of African Americans cast their vote for the very first time. Uh, hours were, the lines were hours long. And that leads me to our last honoree, Danella Brown Wilson. Danella Brown. We made it to the last one. Okay, this would have been in the 1920s when there was a huge resurgence in participation in the NAACP following the lynching of uh, the three Lohman relatives in Aiken. She graduated from Allen University and became a teacher. So by then she was married. And just like Majeska Simpkins, she could not, um, she could not teach in Columbia Public School. So she had to travel elsewhere. So she taught at Fort Mott. She later talked at, taught at Lexington and Holly Hill. And here she is uh, at the Fort Mott School, which by the way, there's a GoFundMe happening right now to try to preserve this, which is, which is still standing. This was part of a WPA project. Uh, Eleanor Rosen, Roosevelt was involved as well. This was taken in the 1940s. Of course, the 1940s is when Majeska Simpkins and others are fighting for equal pay for teachers. So she and her husband were both teachers in the 40s and early 50s. And they, that, that case was one. So black teachers should be receiving the same salaries as white teachers, but they weren't. And she and her husband, John Wilson, stood up in Lexington and said that they were the ones that had pushed um, the administration at Lexington schools to give them supplemental pay, sick pay, equal pay, and their contracts were not renewed the next year. By this point, they're living in the Waverly neighborhood. Um, but despite that, she has to go teach all the way down in Holly Hill, Orangeburg in the 50s and room at a boarding house there during the week because that is the only place where she could get a job. This entire time, she's a member of the NAACP. She used to carry her card in her purse. She wasn't always very open about it with her employers after that, but she knew uh, that she was part of this movement that was still pushing for equal rights in the 50s. And you have to remember, 1950s Orangeburg is one of the ground zeros of the White Citizens Council movement uh, as we're moving through school equalization and uh, integration. And so it's a dangerous time for her, um, but she continued to do that. And she, she taught until 1971.
But that takes me back to 1948. And this is one of those photographs from that August 10th, 1948 uh, election. And you'll see in the far right, uh, the far right side carrying the umbrella, that is Mrs. Vanella Brown Wilson voting for the very first time at the age of 39 um, in 1948. Uh, she, along with many of these men and women, voting for the very first time uh, in that Democratic primary. Uh, she would go on to vote uh, in every election for the next 70 years. Uh, this is a quote that uh, she gave in an oral history to Dr. Bobby Donaldson. Every time we voted, we kept losing every time, and yet we kept voting. You have to remember, she wasn't voting every four years or every two years. She was voting every single year in every election, local, state, and national. This is her in 2016, uh, after casting her ballot, um, she unfortunately died the following year. And so I will um, quickly turn it back to Melissa and then turn it over to Robin. Uh, I realize we don't really have time for questions. Um, go ahead, Melissa. I'm so sorry. Um, sorry. I muted myself I to hear cough. you. Sorry. No, no, I muted myself to cough, and then I forgot that I don't have the power to unmute myself. Um, so just very quickly um, to put a little coda on a ratification. So again, you only need three fourths to ratify um, the uh, a constitutional a constitutional amendment. Um, so South Carolina never really had to, but they did so for symbolic reasons in 1969. And so this is uh, Governor uh, McNair. Yes, McNair. Um, and over his shoulder with this lovely hat is Eula Lee Sally, who said, boys, I've been waiting 50 years to tell you what I think of you. And so just the fact that Eula Lee was there at the symbolic signing, I think, is really um fun and notable. And then um, we do not have time to get into the ERA, but um, Alice Paul's work in the ERA continues. Um, and at her, the time of her death in 1977, it actually looks like it might pass. And unfortunately, it does not. And so these issues are ongoing. Thank you all. And I'll just turn it back over to, to Robin. Yep. Um, so yeah, so it's one o'clock. Um, Obviously, Kat and Melissa have a lot of great content to share, and we are, uh, we're, we're delighted to give them a platform to do so. And um, hope you'll join us tomorrow, live stream, 10 a.m., when we will be commemorating She Did Day, the second anniversary of the local uh, recognition of the certification of the 19th Amendment. There's information on our website, as well as the Columbia City of Women website. Again, thank you, Kat and Melissa, for sharing your time and um, and great information with us. And if y'all have questions and want to email them directly to me, our waits at historiccolumbia.org, I will be happy to share them with Melissa and Kat to follow up with you individually. Thank y'all again for being with us. <laughs>